everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Tanya Johnston. I'm the Senior Public Engagement Officer for the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Um, I will try not to go too fast and get overexcited because an overexcited Scottish woman is difficult for even the English speaking <laughs> people to understand. So I will try my best to speak nice and clearly. So this is where I work. This is the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. Wonderful site. Very lucky to work there. Um, as you can tell from the building, it's very old, but we also have modern technology being developed there by the UK Astronomy Technology Centre. I mentioned that I'm uh, employed by the Science and Technology Facilities Council. What are they? Who are they? What do they do? They're one of the seven publicly funded research councils in the UK. They fund scientists like the rest of the uh, research councils, very multidisciplinary, from the very big down to the very small, so from astrophysics to particle physics. But as well as funding the scientists, they also provide the underpinning technology required for various different areas of science. So we have particle accelerators, um, synchrotrons, all sorts of different facilities like this. And of course, we're involved in many of the large telescope facilities. Because SDFC is a bit of a, of a complex beast to understand um, for the public, well, sometimes for me too, We've developed a set of themes to pin our public <coughs> engagement on, and I'm going to talk a little bit about two of those themes this morning. The first theme I'm going to talk about is dark sky discovery. And uh, dark sky discovery has been around since about 2006. It started its life as Dark Sky Scotland, and in that guise, it was a project which was highlighting the importance of the dark skies. In Scotland, we're very lucky to have some of the best dark skies in Western Europe in Scotland because we have so many areas of rural landscape. And it's very much an astronomy engagement program rather than a light pollution um, campaign program. And it's very audience driven. And it's always been about bringing astronomers together with outdoor space um, organisations like, for example, the Forestry Commission, Natural England and bringing together these organisations to make use of open spaces, parks, national parks, and doing stargazing activities in these areas. Very much about training. We're, we're all about sort of making sure that those people in those local areas have the skills to, to actually provide those activities in the long term for their communities. Dark Sky Discovery is the UK sort of extended version of Dark Sky Scotland. And we have a, set, a network of partners around the UK in different regions. And those, those partners have been working with a variety of diverse audiences. We've provided training to Science Centre uh, staff, outdoor educators. And they've been working with a variety of diverse audiences. And there's just a short video clip next, hopefully, which we'll play, um, that just talks about one of those particular projects. Dark Skies is a, a fantastic subject matter which is sort of an equal ground for a number of these organisations to, to, to operate on. Um, it's a shared interest and it's sort of open to young and old, every background, uh, everyone can come together to enjoy this subject, it's a great uniter, so that's why I think it's been so successful. <coughs> We realise that in Bradford we do have a situation where a lot of the Muslim children go to madrasa schools after school and we had some feedback from the imams and the teachers at those schools that they were looking for more activities to do, more practical activities, but still related to their heritage and culture. So working with our colleagues at the Royal Astronomical Society, we looked at the programme of Islamic astronomy. We worked with Bradford Council's diversity team and they made links with the mosques and madrasas for us. And we gave each of those madrasas an astrobox, and we trained their tutors to use those astroboxes effectively. In the boxes, they've got six hands-on astronomy-based activities, and some stickers and badges for when they finish to celebrate those activities. When we had the first launch party, with over 160 people there from the age of 2 to 60, it was an amazing success. I would have loved to be able to bottle it to show all the other regions, in fact, show loads of people how amazing it was. Um, I had 62-year-olds coming up to me saying, I never knew that. What they saw uh, using uh, Dr. Robert Massey's software was the solar eclipse at Medina in 632, which is what 
is part of the Quran. So it was a, a perfect link between astronomy but also um, the Islamic culture. After the madrasa had been using their astro boxes for a while, we invited them to the University of Bradford to have a session in our mobile planetarium. Inside, they got to view all sorts of different astronomy software, um, as well as some cool 3D videos, um, some which are about rocket missions and things, which leads on nicely to the event we're having today, where they'll be building and launching their own rockets. Tonight's party is the celebration. This is when everyone who's participated comes together. We've got uh, another small tour. We've got Zulfi Karim, who is the head of the World Curry Festival. He's coming to see what's going on, and he's going to present the final certificates. And then we've got a few more activities in the university building, which is going to be the, the end of the formal part of the project. However, the really good bit is in the autumn, we've arranged some field trips <coughs> where the children will be going out into the parks, into the dark skies around Bradford, and they'll be doing some real-life astronomy, looking at the identified dark sky sites. Did they ever play rocket in the stands? You, you don't understand, Jamie. I think the Madrasa project has been really good for Bradford and it's been really good for the Dark Skies project. But what it's done is it's given us an opportunity to run a successful pilot that we will be able to replicate in other areas. We've already got plans to take it out to other, other regions apart from Bradford, um, into Halifax, into Huddersfield, and maybe hopefully even further. But I think. The Dark Skies project has given us a chance to work with groups who wouldn't traditionally engage with astronomy and also to find out what's out there. So we've been able to link the astro astronomical societies with these groups and, and everybody's benefited from it. You know, the astronomical societies want more members. They want to share all the things that they do. And we've been able to put them together but with real practical activities and worthwhile things that relate to them. And I think the important thing with all these projects is to know who you're talking to and pitch the activities and pitch the, um, the learning at the right level. So that's just one of the examples of the diverse groups that we worked with. We've also worked with um, children with behavioural difficulties, um, blind and partially sighted groups as well, and we're putting together um, case studies of all of these activities which will be on the Dark Sky Discovery website. Now, one thing that was mentioned there was that we were encouraging the Madrasa schools to seek out their local dark sky discovery sites. It's a scheme that's been set up as part of the project, and it's making sure that it's not just about rural locations. You can do stargazing in cities, as we've heard already from a few people. And we have this uh, scheme set up, and there are sort of three categories that the dark sky discovery sites have to match. So darkness levels, obviously. So you can either have a dark sky site, which is where you can see the Milky Way with the naked eye, or where you can see the seven main stars of Orion with the naked eye. So very much not technical, so anybody can go and find their local dark sky discovery site. Sight lines have to be good, so not too many high buildings around. And also the access, public access has to be um, sort of very easy. You don't need to have, shouldn't have to have permission to access the site. You should be able to go whenever you like but also it should be accessible for all, so ideally a flat, firm ground so that you know, wheelchair users, for example, can go to the site as well. Um, we've got over 80 sites set up around the UK so far. People just nominate them, get a letter of support from their local authority, and this is just an example of a, a sort of marketing leaflet that the North Pennines have set up, which is like a natural park area in England. Um, and they have 13 dark sky discovery sites there. Another group that um, I personally have been working with recently are the deaf community. So we've been working on British Sign Language um, because until very recently, the, many of the signs relating to astronomy and other sciences, you had to rely on finger spelling, um, which is all very well. It lets you know what the actual words are, but doesn't really tell you much about the concepts themselves or really give you an idea of the, the object. So together with some linguists and scientists, deaf linguists and deaf scientists, we've developed over 80 new signs for astronomy, which are all going to be available online for people to, to view, and we've done some activities to pilot these. We worked with a focus group from, uh, from the deaf community, asked them what they would like, what they would find useful in terms of new signs. Um, and I think you'll agree that some of the, some of the uh, signs are particularly good. I particularly like that one from each of so, so yeah, over 80 signs and it's <laughs> been a fantastic project to work on. 
So I'll move on, but um, yeah, all these videos will be available online as well, along with definitions. So the next theme is much more about telling the story of STFC, so it's a big telescopes theme, and obviously there are many different big telescope projects either out there already or um, in sort of manufacture at the moment and we're talking to the public about these because many of the of STFC scientists are involved in these telescopes whether through building technology for them or actually using the data from these telescopes and often the question we're asked is well why do you need so many telescopes so this is about telling that story of why a family of telescopes is required and one just won't do um, so we've set up a big telescope network in the UK, bringing together lots of people who've been involved in major big telescope projects, mostly people that have been involved in the building of the telescopes, to better coordinate our efforts in terms of communicating with the public. Along with our corporate communications team in STFC, we've created a large exhibit um, all about big telescopes called Seeing the Universe in All Its Lights. This is based on the success of another exhibit which STFC created about the Large Hadron Collider. Um, this is one of the, one of the uh, reasons this has been created is so that it can go to stakeholder events to influence the, the policy makers. Uh, so we've had it at the Parliament last week in London. It's going to the Welsh Assembly in November and it'll go to Northern Ireland and Scotland Assembly too um, later in the year. But we were also taking it to large public events, so it was at Jodrell Jodr Live this summer, which is actually a music festival event that Jodrell Jodr Bank started running, um, and several thousand people go to this event, so we have the exhibit there. Um, over the past few years, we at the Royal, Royal Observatory have been running teacher workshops. Um, one of our most successful ones that we've been running is a national teacher event with the National Science Learning Centre based on the James Webb Space Telescope, so using space as a context for teaching science. It's a residential uh, workshop. People come to the observatory, they meet the scientists and engineers who are involved in the project, but they also have educational activities provided by education specialists. This is some of the teachers being um, shown about adaptive optics technology um, by one of our engineers. And this is then working on a particular resource that I created, which is to do galaxy clusters. So this is the only national um, teacher training event that happens outside of um, the National York Science Learning Centre, apart from a trip to CERN. But um, all the rest of the national teacher workshops happen at York, so it's quite unique in the sense that it is a residential <coughs> one. And based on the success of the James Webb one, we're actually going to be running one next year based on Gallia. Finally, we've partnered up with the British Association of Planetaria. Um, there are 44 presenter-led domes in the UK, seeing around half a million people per year. And what we're doing is we've conducted a survey of these members of the British Association and um, asked them what they would like in terms of information to help them to include in their um, planetaria pre presentations. And we're providing them with the current research and technology development information so that they can add that into their presentations. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. And I don't think we have any time for questions. <laughs> really good. Did you know, what do you think about the long-term legacy of these things? Because a lot of the projects, they tend to be set up and it's very difficult. You have a framework, but it's often then quite difficult to carry on, you know, unless you have a really energised set of volunteers. They're quite long, <laughs> yeah, so you try to give a choice. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that STFC, through, through STFC, we've been able to do is provide first small funding to partners that we've uh, already worked with in the project to enable them to keep working on the projects that they've been doing, so hopefully it will continue. 
So we say in the UK that we're moving from Scotland all the way down to Wales, and our next speaker is Edward talking about LCOGT. Uh, my apologies if uh, you're expecting Amelia to speak. <laughs> I think she's down on the program to give this talk. So um, uh, I work for Las Cumbres Observatory, and uh, that is a global network of robotic telescopes that you can use for science or with the public. In 2005, the first telescopes that became Las Cumbres Observatory were uh, folded into the network. Uh, this telescope is, is Fuchs Telescope North, and I think some of you in the room have used this telescope. Uh, Fuchs Telescopes, anybody use them? Yeah, a couple of you. Well, I'm pleased to announce that uh, we have a celebrity in the room. I won't point him out because he's a very shy, retiring type of chap, but Dil Fawkes, uh, who provided lots of support uh, in getting these telescopes built, uh, is in the room. And uh, if you buy him some drinks, I'm sure he'll tell you incredibly interesting stories about that procedure. So we have two two-meter telescopes as part of the network, the Fox telescopes. We have 10 one-meter telescopes. And this is uh, uh, the, now I have to play a game now. You have to uh, guess which one I'm going to point at. Um, I'll try and always point at this one. Um, we have 10 one-meter telescopes in our network. And these were custom designed like the two-meter telescopes. This is our testing facility in Santa Barbara in California. And um, the, uh, you can see next to the one meter that there's our 0.4 meter telescopes. Now, we have two two meters, 10 one meters, and they are currently operating in the field now doing science as we speak or as I speak. 0.4 meters, we don't have any yet, apart from these two in our testing facility. But in 2014, we're going to have four, maybe more, which will be entirely given up to education and public outreach. As I said before, the other telescopes are used predominantly for science, um, professional science, but these ones will be dedicated to education and public outreach. They're in Siding Spring in Australia. <clears throat> the two meter Fox telescope south is in that, and two one meters in these two uh, domes. Ceritololo in Chile and Sutherland in South Africa, and actually if you look at that URL, you'll see a montage video that I've put together of the installation of those telescopes, and I'll tweet that later on so that you can pick it up. Uh, it's quite fascinating, I did a time lapse over a whole um, three day period of these telescopes being installed. But, sometimes, if any of you have been observing, you get this situation, where your telescopes are covered in snow, and you can't do any observing. If you've got individual telescopes, then you lose your observing because you're there. You can't do anything about the weather. So that's the idea of putting these telescopes into a network. This is a, a global network, but not just a global network in some ethereal sense because there's a, um, an organization over the top. These are all interconnected. So each one of these filled in circles is where it's a site that we have telescopes at. The, um, these two circles are ones where we're hoping to put telescopes. So you can see we've got a lot of telescope sites. But with this magic, sorry, that's our functional block diagram. There'll be a test on that later. With, uh, with this bit of magic, um, a black box can reschedule. That's the internet, if any of you are <laughs> fans. Um, you can make a request to our robotic scheduler, and it will just go to whichever telescope is most appropriate for that observation. This is currently working now, so you don't have to worry about um, your telescope being weathered out or there being technical problems. It will just get shuffled around the network. This is a great boon for professional science, but also for the public and for education, because there's nothing more disappointing than clouds rolling in just as you've got people motivated to do some really cool astronomy. So uh, because this is a uh, communicating astronomy for the public talk, I made a video of a year's worth of observations as our telescopes came online, as the new one meter telescopes came online. So you'll see a sh very short one minute video. Each site is color coded. Thank <laughs> you. 
It's just getting good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so I guess that video uh, isn't going to work. I'll tweet the. Uh, it's on YouTube as well. Um, so pity about that. Basically, it shows that uh, you can see as time went on, we get more and more capacity, and that's the key thing: lots of capacity for lots of people to use the network. So as well as these facilities, this is a, in the facilities section, we've produced a, uh, astronomy resources, and I don't have time to go into all of them, but I just wanted to give you a little taste of things that you can use that we've produced in, the, um, in your astronomy communication work. This thing called Virtual Sky is a planetarium that you can embed into any web page. It's highly customizable. You can change the projections. You can, um, if you, in, inside the web page, you can uh, move the sky. You can uh, enable constellations. You can uh, have uh, a black and white view if you need to print it. Uh, you can ch change your location, the, uh, the time, and uh, you can even have a full sky projection. That looks a bit weird because the, uh, uh, the ground is turned on. Uh, another thing I just wanted to quickly tell you about was Agent Exoplanet. This was an experiment. We wanted to put together a project where people could use data from our telescope but without having to download the data or software in order to do this experiment, this investigation. So we put it all into a website. People look at astronomical images and they do photometry, but we don't tell them it's photometry. We ask them to place apertures, these little uh, colored markers, over stars and compare the brightness. Then that's aggregated across everyone involved in the project and you get a, an exoplanet light curve out of it. And that light curve is automatically is an, is an automatic process. It tells you the uh, it gives you a model of the solar system of that extra solar system. You can see that actually the, the star whizzes back and forth. It just happens to be behind the, sun, the star there, which is uh, the planet whizzes back and forth. But it also gives you some detailed information how we calculated that, and uh, the uh, and further down on that page the parameters that 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 you contributed to uh, making. We did another communication uh, type event, which is called Show Me Stars. A bit of banter on Twitter between me and a UK comedian called Dara Breen led to a series of these uh, Twitter events. I tweeted to uh, this UK comedian, would you like to use a robotic telescope? And he said, OK, which, was, which surprised me because you know I'm a nobody and he's this famous TV personality. Uh, so he used the telescope and tweeted each of his pictures, but also tweeted some funny stuff and tweeted what was actually happening at the time. So we created a page, and we've run this uh, four times now with different UK celebrities. The very first event, we learned the very important lesson that if you put everything onto a web server like Galaxy Zoo, very quickly, when a lot of people look at that website, it goes boom. Uh, so 10 minutes into this session, 40,000 people made simultaneous hits and our web server melted. So we had to frantically push stuff onto Amazon Web Services in order to try and cope with that demand. But it was incredibly popular. And Dara Green, the first um, uh, chap who did it, has a million Twitter followers. So um, even if a, a fraction of those, at least 40,000 of those, got to experience some astronomy in their lunchtime by following this guy who's a comedian and not an astronomer, it was a, a very interesting experiment at engaging an audience that isn't normally engaged in that way. So we did it with other people, and we're looking for more people to do it in the future. So now, um, I'm going to make a community call to all of you in the room. We have these facilities, and we have the ability to make programs like I've just shown you, and, and tools for you to use in communication. So if you have ideas on how you can use our robotic telescope network, and particularly if you have a group of people that you regularly work with, um, like Derek Pitts was saying, he has this uh, great community of, of a variety of different groups that he works with. And any of you in the room who work with people, I'd be incredibly pleased to work with you and for you to use our telescopes to fit in with your program. My vision is limited. I'm only one person. Even if I was um, incredibly inspired, I wouldn't have as many ideas as the sum of the people in this room. 
So working together, we can have fantastic opportunities for people that we want to engage with. So we've already um, have lots of partners. Um, the most successful ones uh, have been Fox Telescope Project and uh, the Institute of Astronomy in Hawaii. Um, but we work with many people. The Fox Telescope Project and the Institute of Hawaii, uh, Institute for Astronomy, use about 2,000 hours um, per year on our robotic network. And teachers are already using our telescope through those programs. They're well-supported programs. They're far better supported than I could support. So that's why I want to engage in this community to have your ideas, your support for your community using our resource. And together we can do fantastic things. I'm very excited about partnerships with Astronomers Without Borders, Galileo Teacher Training, Universal Awareness, Hands on Universe, and CSIRO that are coming up in the near future. And um, Mike Simmons uh, and Pedro and Jaya have already mentioned some of those already, and so do Apollo. So I'd be very interested in swelling that uh, cohort of people. 10,000 hours is the amount of time by the end of 2014 that we hope to make available in 0.4 meters in a scalable robotic sense. So I really hope that you guys would like to take a, a bite out of that and use it with your community. So that's how to contact me. And I'm um, happy to take any questions. And, and actually, if you do ask a question, I have a sticker. So that's hopefully an incentive. So Thanks. There should be two stickers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all your sites are related to major observatories, but there was one upcoming in the world in China. I was wondering what did you find there? Is this an astronomical site? Yeah, it's an astronomical site, but it's uh, really only in the discussions uh, stage at the moment. Um, we had a, a delegation from China that went over to Santa Barbara to talk about the possibility of putting telescopes there in a, in a sort of partnership. Very similar to, we have a partnership with St Andrews uh, in Scotland, uh, so it would be a similar partnership to that for one meter telescopes. Okay, last question. Uh, when we're financing? Uh, we're, we're supported by a, uh, a large endowment, but also NSF funding, um, Qatar Foundation, Welsh Assembly Government, STFC, and RAS. Sorry, Lars, now I have to ask that question during coffee break. But you can get your sticker. He just wants a sticker. Yeah. Yes, you can get your sticker. OK, so we, we stay in a global project of moving from optical astronomy, moving to radio. And uh, I'll ask Sam to come and give his talk about SKA in Africa. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sam Tomenzi. First time at the CAP conference, a bit nervous. Uh, I must say I've, I've learned a lot from all the, all the discussions, and it's been a very, very good call from my side. Uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about what we do with the SKA in Africa, sharing the excitement of this uh, mega telescope with uh, some people in Africa, more specifically South Africa. Uh, for those of you who don't know where Africa is, that's a, that's a very colorful continent. Uh, South Africa is just here at the, at the bottom of, of Africa. Um, a lot of astronomy in South Africa takes place... Uh, back. A lot of astronomy in South Africa takes place in this province here. They've got a very active astronomy community and a lot of rich history in, in astronomy. Uh, but just above this province here, there's a province of the, of the Northern Cape. And in the Northern Cape, that's where you find the SALT telescope. But that's also where you find this, this particular telescope. This is the, the SKA telescope. Uh, this telescope is not only being built in, in South Africa. We also build, we are co-hosting it with, uh, with Australia. But within Africa, we've got uh, a number of other partner countries, about eight of them that we are sharing this, this, telescope, this telescope with. Uh, myself, I sit in the in the ACD program within the SKA, the Human Capital Development Program. 
Now, when SKA or South Africa was making plans to host this telescope, we realized that we had to build up a lot of human capital, a lot of human resource in the field of astronomy, South Africa and Africa being a developing country and continent. We had to work a lot and, and build up a lot of astronomers within, within, this, within the country. And we've done so successfully to some extent. We've got a lot of, of successful programs and, and the community of astronomers is, is growing. We, we have a number of very exciting, exciting programs, including the, the bursary program that we run. And I think to date we've sponsored more than about 400 students that have, have gone through the SKA program. Uh, one of my main responsibilities is the SKA schools program. Now, SKA is situated in the rural part of South Africa. And uh, there's the schools there, uh, before SKA came along, there was very little maths and science education taking place in the schools. And SKA being in a world class, being a world class instrument, and uh, wanted to make a difference in this community, and we wanted to uplift the schools in that, in that area. There's only one high school, surprisingly, that's teaching maths and, and science in, the, in that area. And uh, it being a rural part of South Africa, a lot of skilled teachers don't really stay in these places. They all move to, to, to urban, urban areas. But we, we are working very hard with the schools to try and, and uplift it. Now, I told you that SKA has uh, an extensive bursary program. But to date, we are yet to sponsor a student from uh, a high school where the SKA is being built because none of them actually pass matric or grade 12 well to go to, to university. So that's one of our biggest challenge. Uh, last year we started this program here called a okay. last year we started this program here called a, a grade 8 bursary program because we realized that And waiting for, for these grade 12 learners to pass metric and, and go to university is nothing. But if we start at a, at a lower grade and, and sponsor learners from the area to come to the high school and, and, and do math and science, we might eventually, hopefully after some years, get a few of them to actually go through and do some science-related related careers. Uh, but I'm here to mainly talk to you about our, our outreach program, which is uh, fairly, fairly young. It's a baby. Outreach was being done at SKA and thanks to, to Kevin and, and all the other people that were, were involved. And uh, when, I, when I joined the SKA, which was a year and a half ago, uh, I had to come up with a strategy on how can we expand the outreach program. Now, currently, we're only doing it mainly in, in, in South Africa, but we're hoping to expand further into, into, into other African countries. Now, we rely a lot. Currently, I rely a lot on the, on the national projects. There's a number of projects that have been running for years in South Africa, and we try and pick it back on those that we hope that astronomy gets out there. Uh, South Africa celebrates uh, National Science Week annually. This is a very, very big event in South African science, and the Department of Science and Technology funds this particular project that we get a lot of Know, facilities and, and, and institutions involved. What was exciting about this year's National Science Week was that astronomy was highlighted as one of the main themes that people that want to, or facilities that wish to participate in National Science Week should, should focus on. Uh, so I think this, this helped push SKA a bit and, and highlight it among, among the people. We also partner with uh, SAA, or South African Astronomical Observatory, to run the astronomy quiz in the Northern Cape province. Now, Northern Cape is the biggest province in South Africa. And we partnered with SAA. Oh, this, this particular initiative is a, is a very good one. It's an astronomy quiz aimed at grade 7 learners in South Africa. So it's a knockout type of, type of competition. And at this particular event, uh, got about four, four learners from uh, a school in the Northern Cape that had just qualified to go to the national finals. So this is also a very great way of getting SKA into, into the public eye. 
Now, South Africa has an agency which is uh, advanced in science and, and technology. And annually, I think they started last year running the SKA schools competition. Uh, this year, uh, this has just come out this year, and, and they'll be doing a poetry competition. So I guess this adds a bit of art into, into science for grade four and, and eight learners, and they'll be they'll have to say something about the the SKA project. So this is also a very very good initiative on our part, and and we're hoping that uh, we'll reach a lot more learners and excite a lot more learners about the the SKA project. One of the easiest way for us to get into the public eyes to join in on science festivals. Now, South Africa has a number of, of science festivals that take place uh, uh, annually, and we try and, and, and participate in these actively, and we get to see a lot of people through these science festivals. Uh, this is our Minister of, of Science Technology, and that's one of the young astronomers from, from the SKA project. So wherever we go, because this is a, a, a world-class telescope, this is a very big project, we get a lot of, of, of attention from, from, from important people, and I guess this helps in, in putting us in the media and other, other things. We not only do science festivals in South Africa, we do science festivals across the Southern Africa, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. So we try and reach as many people as, as possible and try and publicize this, this project as much as, as possible. Now, when I, when, I, when I was thinking of how can we increase SKA in the public eye, I immediately thought of science centers. South Africa has about 34 science centers uh, all over. And uh, I thought that it would be a very, very good thing for us to partner with science centers and instead of me always trying to do SKA outreach, have them actually carry out SKA outreach by themselves. We can just give them resources. <laughs> And uh, luckily, this year, one of the science centers in, in Pretoria, just above Johannesburg in South Africa, uh, the lady that runs the science center managed to get some international funding. And she was uh, told that she should build a rocket launching station with the funding. Uh, luckily, she, 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 she thought that you know, South Africa does not have a rocket launching station, and this won't be very relevant to the South African community. She managed to convince the funders that it would be better for, for, for her to build something along SKA, and she decided to build um, a mini SKA control room uh, for, for, for the learners. And uh, we're very, very excited. Uh, we recently just took a visit to site, and that was very, very exciting. So such initiatives help to take SKA into the, the public eye. Now, we, we develop a number of, of resources. Uh, this is one of the very, very successful resources that we've, we've developed. This is a, a, a comic series called Mission Meerkat. And uh, it's written at a level of uh, very, very young, young people. But we find that very young and old people relate to this, to this comic. We've had three, three of, the, of the episodes come out. And uh, we are busy with the, with the fourth one at the moment. So this has been a very, very great way of getting SKA into the public eye. This, this particular comic, we, we always get a lot of requests to, to have it available for people. And uh, yes, it's extremely exciting, especially when you go to science festivals. Now, SKA, as I said, being a major project in a, in a developing country like South Africa, we, we always in the media. And this, this helps in some way in trying to get SKA in the public eye. Right? We try and, and do all kinds of media, uh, radio, TV, social media. And uh, I think in some way we are making a bit of inroads in that. Uh, the only thing I can say that maybe we are not doing enough of is that you know, Petra spoke about evaluation on the, on the first day. I don't think there's enough of that being done from, from our side. And I think that's something that we, we really need to start focusing on if we could evaluate the impact of the SKA. And a lot of what we do is currently on mainly awareness and, and just making people aware of the project. But we are not doing anything that SKA related directly in terms of performance, increasing the performance of the people that we interact with. So I think 
one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping that we could do in the future is develop resources that are directly linked to, to the SKA project. They could be curriculum linked, that would make it easy for them to get into the schools and that way we could reach out a lot more people. And uh, I'm hoping that in the future we can uh, start working a lot more closely with our eight African partner countries and maybe not just those, to spread SKA all over Africa. Thank you very much. Questions again? One question. Hi. Um, okay, it's more a, a comment and a request. Uh, I'm Sarah. I work in, in Ghana. I'm a volunteer at the Planetarium. I'd love to be involved with you with your uh, developing resources and outreach with one of your partner countries because we have a real struggle. We have the same problems you're talking about with the maths and science education. Very little astronomy on the curriculum, and almost nobody knows about the SKA. Um, we're fighting hard to get people to understand it's a huge, fantastic project for Ghana. Most people, their kids go to school, they want them to be a banker or a semester, that's it. So we're trying to change that, so I'd like to keep in touch with them. Thank you, thank you very much. No more questions? Uh, one. You're talking about curriculum. Is there a, a decent amount of astronomy project? Uh, not enough, not enough. Uh, what I find in South Africa, uh, maybe this is just my it's just my observation, is that the, there's a lot of investment being put into into astronomy by the Department of, of, of Science and Technology, but you don't get the same response from the Department of Education. It would be, it would be I think, good if the two departments could talk, if, you, if the government is putting so much money into this form of science that the education responds to that. I'm sure that will be the case in South Africa because it's coming from the government departments. Okay, thank you, Sam. We stay in the same wavelength, but moving back to, to Europe, about the European hands-on universe and the project uh, connecting classrooms to the internet. <laughs> uh, hands-on universe, you know, it's a network of scientists and educators working together for uh, reawakened students of the interest for science and technology. So, next. As you know, the effectiveness of our instruction has been studied, and uh, it is well known that lecture alone is not the most effective way to teach students. Teaching by telling is surprisingly ineffective if you want students to master. So minds must be active to learn. And I recall that mind is a fire to be kindled, not a person to be filled. And also, it's not what the teacher does that matters, but rather it's what the students do. And the last, the fatal pedagogical error is to give answers to students who do not yet have questions. So, Enzon University is trying to do with it to, to manage that. Learning science by doing science. So, the idea is to bring the actual frontline research into the classroom, to develop pedagogical tools on real astronomical data. It's a big, uh, very useful tool for outreach for science teachers, secondary schools, or even. Uh, we've tried to reach a large number of pupils and uh, we have a multilingual approach. So since 2004, Edson University in Europe is funded by, uh, partly funded by the European Commission and up to 15 partner countries are involved. We have developed, for instance, a, a, a software dedicated to education. usable directly in classrooms by pupils called Salsagi and we have from data to physics. It's a multilingual software even in Arabic, in Chinese and so on. To analyze images and spectra. Okay. And about 20 uh, and the new training, the teacher training session for European teachers have been organized at many national sessions. It means that hundreds of teachers have been trained and thousands of European pupils have used HOU tools. And let me say that in 2009, 
uh, this project was awarded the silver, uh, the European Commission silver medal for innovation and creativity, large number of improvement. Okay. Just an example of exercise which are very, which is very popular and which has been tested in school, which is working very well in classrooms. It's how to detect an extrasolar planet with the radio with the radio velocity metal. You know that because of the presence of the planet, it just the host star has a small periodic motion around the center of mass. We are doing the spectra of the star. When the star is receding from you, there is a red shift in radio velocity, which is approaching to you, there is a blue shift. So we provide the, the, the pupils with uh, several spectra. And uh, you see at the bottom the several spectra moving in time. And they can uh, measure the radio velocity, measure the shift with time, and uh, apply the Doppler uh, effect and reconstruct the radio velocity curve as a function of time and derive the mass of the planet. This is usable in schools, in classrooms during one or two hours. And uh, just another example because of the very extremely beautiful images you saw yesterday about the center of the galaxy with the adaptive optic image of the center of the galaxy, stars are resolvable and so pupils in classroom can reconstruct the orbit of a star around the center of the Milky Way, and by applying just the Kepler law, they can derive the mass of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And it, 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 that's cool. So the, 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 the most recent project of Anton Universe was connecting classroom to the Milky Way. So I come back to radio astronomy. It was the development of a European network of small radio telescopes for education. And it's uh, opening a new window on the universe to explore the Milky Way from school. So 11 countries are involved in that project and five small antenna have been implemented in five countries in Poland, Romania, France, Spain and Portugal. You, have, you see the people involved in that, the king of meeting in Paris, the entities involved. So the small antenna about two meter diameter with a resolu special resolution seven degree, but it's enough to make to make to, to map the Milky Way in the H1 neutral hydrogen H1 21 centimeter, and uh, the spectral resolution is, is uh, right. So it was a challenging project because we have to provide a scheduling system to access the telescope, the web interface to remotely control them and to observe the growth. We, have a, we are providing a simulator mode to perform the same exercise, but with a, a better quality data. An archiving system and online tools to analyze the data. Of course, everything is multilingual, adapted to pupils. <laughs> And uh, we have constructed built the pedagogical support material, teacher manual video, podcasts, and so on and so on. And, and all pedagogical activity, like for instance, kinesthetic activity, uh, we'll come back to that. And it's a very useful tool for out uh, outreach materials, <coughs> exhibition. And in the framework of the SKA project, it can be very useful. Just to show you the Milky Way as seen from above. And with a little bit of trigonometry, pupils can reconstruct, can first map the galaxy, the Milky Way, in the H1 centimeter, reconstruct the radio, uh, rotation curve of the galaxy, and uh, feel, uh, see uh, from where it comes the concept of dark matter, because the rotation curve is constant. Just to show you, this is the Milky Way observed in H1 and the, the different programs. This and the Milky Way is rotating, so you can reconstruct the rotation, and you will see images. Each image corresponds to a different velocity, and you see the rotation of the galaxy in the, the left. And it's the rotation of the galaxy. So the pupils can observe that and reconstruct the velocity. Okay. 
This is the uh, view of the simulator. So in the simulator, you have the Milky Way the map. It shoots wavelengths. You can click on the uh, somewhere. You have the different coordinates. You have the spectra at this point, and you have the rotation curve. Everything is uh, explained in uh, available for free in the website. It is open now to registration. You have to create an account. This is free, and you just have to make some uh, uh, some sentences about your motivation. Uh, just an example of the kinesthetic activity introduced in secondary school teacher. It's on the ground. You calculate some uh, lines, and after the teacher can uh, walk along this line and feel. Uh, the relative rotation versus differential rotation. And also with the elastic ropes, it's, uh, uh, during their, uh, their walk along the line, they can feel the redshift when the elastic stretches, or the blue shift when the elastic ropes slack. We have a built exhibition on radio astronomy because radio is very new, very new in, uh, in schools. For middle schools or for high school in 10 languages, you have just an example for middle school and another example for the, for the rest. And the last uh, view half is the, the next five days training session for European teacher, which, are, which will be organized by Amazon University Europe. So it's in March next year and in June for March. No, any teacher from the Europe from Europe can apply for funding from this Communist National Agency. For the the training session in March it's too late now. But for the one in June, the deadline to apply for funding is mid February next year. And there will be another uh, five day training session in May and also the deadline for to apply for funding is mid-channel. So all teachers in Europe can apply that. Next, thank you. We have time for questions. Please learn. Do you have some ideas on other experiments with the same antenna? As you know, the antenna and only uh, one activity is a little bit not too much. With this kind of antenna, you can observe H1, but you cannot go outside the Milky Way. Yes, I see. So, so you can do what you want with this antenna as long as you register. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I have one question. How many schools outside the network have been using the, the, the telescopes? Because any teacher can register, right? Yes. You get many requests. Not yet. Because the information, the advertisement is not yet done properly. And also because uh, most of the teachers, at least in France, but not uh, everywhere, you know, most of the teachers has, are a little bit afraid to, to go in such a new domain of uh, astronomy. Radio, they even don't know what is radio astronomy, or even the radio web. There's one more question. But I'll ask the next speaker to move into the front so we can move fast, but then we have one question. Very simple question. Have you listened to pulsars with your bit? No, no. He didn't try, but I think it's not feasible. It's high. OK. If you are a specialist of Pulsar, you're going to try. Yeah. All you have wonderful tools. So we're going to move now from ground base and now go to space missions. And this is an internet analog of the Mars mission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mateusz. That's correct. That's, uh, uh, that's an analog solution. Uh, our idea is not uh, a revolutionary one uh, because there are Mars yards operated uh, mainly by space agencies and they are sometimes made available to the public to, um, for kids for the youth to, to visit. Uh, but our idea is um, a bit, it has some differences and the way we got to it, it was much different uh, too. Uh, we are not a space agency, we are a society. Uh, and we are supported by a company. So we are developing uh, that from scratch uh, on our own. Uh, 
the background uh, of this idea was participation in uh, uh, Mars Society's European Rover Challenge uh, uh, between 2009 and this year we've, we've sent uh, nine student rovers uh, to the US uh, as only European representatives of uh, uh, of this trend. Uh, in this competition, it was basically an American competition, but uh, we contributed uh, to it making it international. There were Canadian teams as well. But um, since we found very uh, talented students uh, in Polish universities, and they got uh, really excited about the idea, there was no other way just to uh, support those teams and to send them uh, not on Mars yet, but uh, for them it was like in the Mars mission because it was uh, really exciting first uh, first uh, in their lifetime um, experience in the desert in an analog uh, analog site it's in Utah uh, for those of you who come from countries uh, that do have big empty spaces uh, with uh, rocks and analog regolith it's nothing exciting but for uh, for Polish students it was pretty stimulating um, we do not have an area that could simulate uh, Mars at remote conditions. Uh, so this was uh, this was pretty uh, a challenge, and those rovers were very successful, both in the U.S. and then coming back to Poland, uh, they become quite of celebrities actually in in the in the area, very popular on the media. This was a winning rover. Uh, this is actually uh, a list of of all those rovers. So we had two wins. Uh, it was Magma 2 uh, from the Awistock University of Technology, and this year we had Hyperion team also from the Awistock. Uh, what's uh, what's important is that uh, this Poland had not uh, uh, a space program, and uh, all the all the um, achievements were actually in terms of, of the space technology were rather um, performed abroad. So we had great specialists, but they were mainly successful in the US or on the, in Europe. It was uh, um, on the verge of uh, joining ESA uh, last year. It was something that really moves the imagination of, of the society. So the, the teams, uh, the, the young guys, got a very nice publicity, um, and they were very successful. Uh, by the way, we, uh, it, it was just last week that we've announced uh, the edition. We are uh, Next fall, we are organizing the European edition of this of this competition. Uh, pretty similar, but uh, since we do not have the, the big desert, we have to we have to make something which is uh, a uh, more laboratory-like environment. It's going to be in the open, but um, but it's going to be shaped um, a bit. So um, this is our idea of uh, of the yard. Uh, after the, all those rovers, uh, in order to uh, to not let those teams get dispersed and to, to let them um, work on their passion, uh, we decided to, uh, uh, to try to commercialize what they do, because since we do not have a Mars mission, so they cannot work on the rover uh, directly to Mars, we had to come up with some ideas. Uh, at from scratch, also we've established a company, a small startup, uh, and we have a small rover and, and a big rover. So the big rover is a more professional analog testing platform for, for testing of space, space-bound equipment, uh, actually, and also doing some presentations and outreach. And the small one is, uh, uh, is smaller, and it can be used, actually, um, by, uh, by anyone without, uh, without a professional uh, background. And they are all run by the same control system, and they are controls over. The, they can be controlled over the internet. So this basically gives us a big advantage. Uh, the big, the story of the big rover. Uh, we've been using it in uh, in analog uh, missions. Uh, so we've done uh, two big uh, international programs. Uh, one in Dachstein last year. There were ice caves. Uh, so actually, this is the the, the, G, the ground penetrating radar for wisdom, and it, it is. This is being built by the French, by the French uh, team for the ExoMars mission. So this is actually space-bound equipment. Uh, since the, the Wisdom team had, uh, has not uh, a rover uh, to, to test, we just offered uh, the, the opportunity for testing. Um, uh, it was a mutual benefit, actually. Uh, the, the, we are probing the, the ice uh, in, in ice pops, in ice caves, uh, so pretty successful. Uh, next. Uh, um, 
next uh, mission was uh, Morocco um, in Sahara. It was a month uh, long mission. Uh, so, and this was the first time that we actually had the rover operated via satellite uh, from Toru and from Innsbruck. We've been doing it uh, together with, with Austria Space Forum uh, that runs a, a facility in Innsbruck. Um, so we basically plugged the rover to their system, and we we, operate, we set it up in the desert, and we came back to the core team came back to Poland and operated it remotely. It was pretty easy. It was not uh, the bandwidth was uh, was pretty um, low, uh, but uh, the functions allow um, allow the bandwidth to it's sufficient for those functions that we've designed. So um, it does not require really large bandwidth. And it has some functions that allow uh, it to operate even if there are some problems with, with the connection. Uh, so this brings us also to an idea of ha having it available uh, wider, not only by, by the creators. Uh, the, uh, the device, it was a different device. Uh, uh, it, was, uh, it is called LIFE, uh, laser-induced fluorescence uh, experiment, basically a uh, chlorophyll uh, detector developed by the Austrians. Yeah, the low, low, low bandwidth uh, just puts uh, s such uh, uh, limitations, uh, but we were fine with this, and uh, we try to make it uh, an advantage that, that we kind of offer low, uh, low, low resolution uh, image over the internet just to keep it stable. Uh, the rover worked with uh, with an analog astronaut suit. Uh, <coughs> Also developed by the Austrians, so some functions uh, are already integrated. Mm. Uh, well, as I said, for those of you who come from countries with such a nice terrain, it's quite obvious. But uh, for us, it was opportunity to uh, to learn the the, um, the requirements of the environment, uh, not Mars-like, but it is a pretty good analog at uh, international uh, communities. It was near air food uh, in Morocco, so so there are there are pretty good analogies, and uh, there's been uh, some analog Mars analog uh, research uh, done there, uh, not only by by Poles and Austrians, but also for for international teams. Uh, pretty pretty simple things. Uh, we try to keep it simple and and uh, understandable for for a potential user. Uh, so this is. Uh, like a tourist-like GPS that allows you to track the rover and, and to uh, to, um, to document the, tra the traverse. All the systems are actually based on consumer uh, computers. Uh, these are the, the, the Austrian systems. Um, we we run on the, on PC protocols, so so it's pretty uh, understandable. And this comes to having it available to the public. Um, so this is the idea um, that we are developing. Actually, we are in the middle of development of, of the Mars Yard. Uh, we do not have the facility uh, set in one place yet. But this is pretty obvious. Uh, just a room, a space. Depends on, on the, how much space uh, we want. The rover is a 40 centimeter um, uh, robot, uh, completely remote controlled by simple routers. And uh, the trick, the trick is in the rover, uh, the, the, the structure and the system uh, that they are uh, simple and real, real, reliable, and uh, also the program. So we do not have, uh, we do not want to, to uh, have it only controlled and driven around those stones. Uh, we uh, we are writing a script. We we do have uh, we do have uh, first booklets, first, first versions of the booklet uh, of a mission. So the uh, the idea is to to have this um, this booklet made available to schools um, to probably send uh, send a teacher or train a teacher there or uh, make a remote training so the students can uh, prepare. Their mission, and they can um, split into the, the, the engineering and driving uh, uh, group and the science group that would plan the experiment. And actually, uh, we we do have also a solution which I would not discuss right now. But uh, uh, there are the, the terrain is not just a raw uh, regolith. It's gonna be planted with samples, and the the software system 
will be actually uh, able to um, to recognize the samples and um, those samples will be described. Uh, so they, they have the whole teaching uh, hands-on experience, not only the driving and, and having the uh, the rover the rover um, uh, in some remote place. This is also um, an advantage that you can have many simulators and uh, virtual uh, virtual rovers, virtual Mars missions, and so forth. That we all know it from from the internet, from from the games. But th this is. Um, even if you give um, uh, the school a computer, so there is the barrier of, of, the, of the screen, but actu actually they do have the... Uh, the experience that they run, the actual... Uh, that is not a virtual thing. Even if the, ex uh, the, the experience is in some way similar to virtual, because you have the flat screen, uh, the, the operation is... Real. So there is the, the psychological barrier that, that, that we cross, that they have the hands-on experience on, on a rover that is actually in a remote, remote place, which is also important, and which enables global access. So Internet allows you to log from any place uh, in the world. Uh, the campaign assumes that we first visit, uh, we first visit the school and show them the rover, and uh, then they operate the rover remotely. And we've done... Uh, We've looked for, for some nice places, so we've done the first uh, the first um, test uh, actually last week. It was done in Torun, uh, not in a desert, but uh, on a section of something that resembles desert. Worked pretty well. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the simulator uh, well, it's 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 sufficient. Uh, the task was to put a, a sample into the box. And uh, actually, we did we did connection with two groups. So we connected with an Indian group, with Indian school, um, and then we connected with the Polish school, uh, Polish uh, conference for use in Sheraz. So we, this was pretty successful. First test. Uh, the system works. Uh, now we basically uh, search for uh, two things. So uh, for the facility that we set it permanently, and for the users. Uh, so. Uh, this is all for me. If you have any questions, do we have time for questions? We have time for questions. Okay. Questions? No questions. I have more questions. Um, how many schools do you involve in your programs so that you have a connection with the Coffee Youth Conference? Do you try to involve teachers and students in secondary schools in the, in the development? Uh, actually, we do uh, by visiting schools with the rover. Uh, so we we, we visited uh, for the last two years. We visited about uh, I would say 30 schools, and they were different 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 grades. Even even very young kids, uh, secondary schools. Um, uh, but uh, we do not offer the system uh, between it is not, uh, before it's not uh, like uh, completely reliable in check. So this was the first pilot. Uh, the pilot. Uh, this was a test, actually, for for, for the system, uh, for, for the remote control. But uh, the schools are aware aware of it, and we want to work with the schools directly on the program. Any other questions? No, I have one more question then, because you belong to Mars. Society, right? Exactly. The Global Mars Society. Do you share um, frameworks for this? Uh, you use the same technology, or each country develops the, its own? Uh, each group, actually, each each team develops uh, their own rover for the competition. Uh, there's been um, groups in Italy. I know uh, of a group in Italy that wanted to set the rover for the URC competition, but uh, mainly uh, American and Canadian uh, universities. Um, have, uh, have those rovers, and each one is different. They, there are only assumptions of communication and, and the rules of the competition, so they have to stick to the rules, but the, the technology is uh, like open. Thank you. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Mike, and he's going to give us a behind-the-scenes look into the payable dark image from the real <laughs> space mission Cassini. Thanks, Pedro. So uh, I said this is a unique opportunity, and it really is, and I'll explain why here. 
So throughout the space age, which I am a child of, I remember Sputnik uh, going up. So for us, space age means something really special, something that uh, we weren't used to. We've always been fascinated with our look back at Earth. We, this is not one of the first images, of course, but it's one of the nicest ones, partly because it has my home in California in it. And that's something interesting, because we look back and we say, well, that's it, us, and that's where we are. So this is one looking back at Earth. We don't have the timer today? No. no. I'll give you a three minutes. Give me five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> Without a timer, I, I will go on for hours. <laughs> Our first look back at Earth from another planet, from the moon, was also fascinating for us because it puts it in context. It says this is, this is us from another place altogether. And, well, you know, I want to go ahead and I'll come back. This image here is a famous pale blue dot image taken by Voyager. I forget if it was one or two. I always mix them up. Uh, as it was preparing to leave the solar system, from very far out in the solar system, that one little pixel, what uh, Sagan referred to as a pale blue dot. It's hard to even see here in a reflection. There we can see it a little bit better. Of course, it's still one pixel. And then there is this picture of Earth, which confuses people because they're distracted by the big ringed planet there. This was taken by Cassini in 2006. And if you look to the left and slightly up behind the rings, you can see another little pale blue dot, which we can see a little bit closer here. So this is another one that I particularly like because it puts it in context. Rather than, as Sagan called it, a dot suspended in a sunbeam, it shows us our place relative to someplace else. So again, I refer to this as a unique opportunity. Why was this unique? What's the new opportunity? It's simple. That Cassini was about to take a picture, looking back at Earth, for the first time that everyone on Earth know their picture was going to be taken. And this makes a real difference. Rather than, well, here you are. This is done, and it's an ooh-ah moment. But this is a time when everybody has a chance to say, I'm posing for this picture. Let me mention first how this came about. Carolyn Porco, who most of you know of or, or know, is the leader of the imaging team for Cassini. And she searched the timeline for opportunities for something like this ahead of time, where the, uh, the, the sun would be blocked by the planet, so Cassini wouldn't be uh, have its uh, instruments uh, burned out by the direct sunlight. This is something that in 2006 this image was actually taken for scientific purposes. It's an extremely useful thing, but it didn't have the right filters. It wasn't done just to make a pretty picture. It was a mosaic that was useful for backscattering particles and things like that, and it happens to be spectacular. But uh, there, and there are many other opportunities like this in the timeline, but she also had to look for something that didn't have too much competition from other instruments because the scientists want to get their time with uh, these opportunities as well. And July 19th of this year was the best opportunity for it. In order to make this into a good picture for outreach, for involving people, several things that needed to be done, as you can see here, which wasn't done in 2006, adjusting the mosaic, uh, adding a narrow angle image in R2B of the Earth and the Moon and get the, the right settings, and this took months of preparation. But the result was this, the day the Earth smiled. This was is Carolyn, uh, Carolyn's own effort, and she approached astronomers without borders to help bring this to the rest of the world. The idea here being that we are posing. We're all on Earth. We're all smiling for the photograph. Astronomers without borders. Uh, partner to, to have people take part in this as well with a couple of our own events. And uh, this got a lot of attention. I don't have uh, numbers on how much media attention there was, but you can see there are quite a few things here with BBC, CBS, and so on. Uh, some of these I really like. Say Cheese, World Saturn is watching. Uh, Seven billion people and trillions of creatures to be photographed together on, 
on July 19th. So, um, so there was quite a bit of media attention and we did our best to engage people to do outreach during that time as well. We had events that were registered and uh, as a part of the whole, uh, the whole thing. And we provided certificates uh, to those who registered their events and let us know what they did. So it was our usual way of trying to get the word out, getting everybody involved, saying this is one big event, let's all take part in it. And this really was a global event. By definition, this is a global event. We don't, we don't have to brand it that way. This is what the picture is supposed to look like. And while I haven't seen it yet, the final mosaic should be out any day now. Uh, it, and so it's imminent. I keep watching the news while I'm here to see if it's been released yet. There's Earth down there in the lower right. That's what it should look like. But we do have a little bit of a preview, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, as those of you know, I'm a data analyst and statistician who much prefers pictures to numbers when we're talking about things like this, because this isn't about numbers. This is about getting people involved in the impact it has on the people, uh, not the numbers of how many or something like that. So I'm again going to show a few pictures here of <coughs> what uh, was going on. This We had people uh, posing for a mosaic. Let me go back to this. I, I failed to mention that our idea here was to get people to take pictures posing with Saturn in some way, however that's done, and there are a lot of uh, innovative ways of doing it, in order to be a part of a mosaic that would be made up looking like this. This is a simulation of what the final mosaic will look like uh, so that everybody will be in this picture. So it'll be a picture of Saturn and Earth as it's going to be made up of pictures of people posing with Saturn. That's kind of mind-twisting, but that's what it is. So th this is people posing with Saturn in Karachi. Pakistan. These are just some examples of what sort of thing was going on. Also in Karachi, we had people out on the sidewalks with telescopes, with a crowd of one, and with huge crowds. This is in South America someplace, I'm sorry, I don't remember where all these were taken. Or small crowds with huge telescopes. This is when I took at Mount Wilson Observatory where I'm involved with some students we had in a program there who happened to come from as far away as the person at the top, Sri Lanka. We had people who posed with Saturn here. You can say this was here. She put the Earth there on the chalkboard, posing quite uh, primly with her glass, uh, her cup of tea. And then we had people who were very excited about it. <laughs> we had people who took a, a really fun way of doing this, posing with Saturn here, lifting it up, and we had those who were very philosophical. This picture submitted as a mosaic with a quote from John F. Kennedy, a former U.S. president, for in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Uh, Carl Sagan-like uh, quote from 50 years ago. People looking at and pointing to Saturn, low on the horizon. People by the, the seashore or a lake are looking at Saturn above them from the desert of the American Southwest with the saguaro cactus. Guadalajara, Mexico. This is the staff of uh, Celestron Instruments, the world's largest telescope maker and a big supporter of Astronomers Without Borders at uh, their own little observatory they use for testing there. Somebody very patriotic, a lone observer from Turkey, a representative of Turkey. That's Saturn, about to be munched on by this Tyrannosaurus Rex, roaming someplace, I believe, in the United States. I'm not sure exactly where. New Zealand loves Saturn. Iran posing with a, a picture, the picture from 2006. Doing a presentation in the Sahara Desert. I believe this is Morocco, but someplace in the south of the Maghreb. And next to some ancient stones they put in place in Atherbury in the UK. Somebody here can tell me what that is exactly, but it's a historic astronomical site, I believe. Observing in, the, in Iran again. 
another country, I don't remember exactly where. <laughs> on July 19th, it happened that Catherine and Eli here were getting married in London. And their cousin, uh, cousin of Eli, I guess, Jay Pasikoff, who many, a solar physicist many of you know, uh, I saw him in New York. He was headed over to London for this. And he said, they're going to do something with Saturn. And they were married. And this picture was taken, posing with Saturn at the moment that the exposure was being taken. So it's a, they were posing with Saturn, both from Cassini spacecraft and for Jay's camera. And then, of course, the children. These in Columbia doing Saturn projects. I don't remember where this one is from. OK, thank you. This one from Ghana Planetarium. And another caption says, this is Jacob. I don't remember the, con the, the country. In a way, I kind of like that I can't remember the country because they're so similar. It doesn't matter. They're all on Earth. <laughs> this is the entire student body of a small special school in Los Angeles, California, USA, posing as Saturn with the rings going crosswise. And some posing just to say thank you to Carolyn, whose idea this was in the first place, for allowing everybody to take part in this. So this is the difference between this one and the ones that had taken uh, place before. And this is the imaging team, actually. Only those who are based in Boulder, Colorado, where the office is, so there are several missing. Carolyn on the right side of the left-hand group there, posing with Sandra now. In the background, there is a preview that I said I would show you. Some of you may not have seen this yet. This is the part of the mosaic that was taken by Cassini. It's, I think, a relatively raw image. There was some uh, processing done by Bob Agpafrishi, who many of you know. And that large dot on the lower right side, that is the Earth. And it's a little bit more than just a pale blue dot this time. It's more than one pixel. That's zooming in on it. So here is the Earth. It's more than a pixel. And next to it is the moon. So this is really unique, actually. Now, this is one place where I'll mention numbers that I don't know exactly what it was, but it was under what we had hoped for. And this was kind of a surprise because we had huge publicity. But we had fewer pictures for this mosaic submitted than I had, than I had hoped for. And I think there was some confusion about it. We learned a little bit about uh, how to, to uh, Praise the message for this. So there are some that are repeated in here, and they're a little bit bigger pixels than possible. But uh, this uh, still, this is what the mosaic is that's just being released now. There are a couple things of interest. One is the Cassini spacecraft down in the lower left that's been photoshopped in, and the Earth down there, which is still a pale blue dot. But zooming in on the Cassini spacecraft, uh, Bob Ack, who processed this for us, has placed the Cassini imaging team in the satellite's antenna. And looking at the pale blue dot there, well, we, we took a little uh, license with this one and put the AWB logo, which you can see on my shirt, into there. So this is uh, available, actually, uh, online, or will be available very soon. It is a zoomable image. You can zoom in on all the images. And this is the idea. And this is what uh, we're going to be uh, releasing very soon. So how did I do? I fit within my time this time? Very rare. No questions. I think we have some time for one question. Hello? Might come. Well, with the actual exposure, and I'm assuming that only half of the world can be observed, so there's only three and a half billion people at the time? The exposure time was uh, several minutes. I, I forget now, between five and ten minutes, something like that. So not everybody was actually in the photograph, because some people were under clouds and so on. But the idea was that you know we were all there. The mosaic was taken over a period of uh, hours. So because, you know, Cassini can't take a wide-angle picture of, of uh, Saturn all at once. So there were several hours and then several minutes for the, the Earth exposure. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you. Rosa, and last question before coffee. Actually, it's not, it's not a question, it's just a comment that uh, I think that the power of uh, such images as the, the group of astronomers that are borders in Babak, especially, are taking, should be used largely as much as possible because uh, when we are training teachers or trying to inspire students, I think images like this speak more than anything else in the world. So, congratulations for the effort. It's really doing really amazing. Thank you. I, I agree. Pictures are, are better than words, worth at least a thousand. Thank you, Mike. So let's let's go for coffee break. There's a short announcement by.